Well, the first time I preached this message was about two or three years ago, and um, it's in the uh, book of 1 Kings, chapter 17, and it was a totally different um, approach at that point in time. Um, the professor, uh, Dr. Whitfield, said that in his instruction that we were to select a passage that we were familiar with. And I, went, I kept trying to go to the lost son parable in the book of Luke. But I just um, kept being swept away from that. And then I would go to John and I would try to find something in John. And I kept being swept away from that. And then I landed on 1 Kings chapter 17. And that's where I landed. And so over the course of a few weeks, um, I have, um, the good Lord has given me this message. The name of my message, or the title of my message today is called, um, The Fruit is in the Bread. Uh, so let us pray. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for this day. I thank you, Father, for your whole entire written word. I thank you, Father, for all the things that you put in it. And Father, I thank you, Lord, that there are so many different ways that you can talk to us through your word from the same passage. I thank you, Lord, for this evening. I thank you for the ones that are here to hear this message that you've given me to preach. And I know that this message has come from you. And I thank you for that. And I bless this prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I'm going to read my text first, and I'm going to start in verse 8. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zion, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks. And he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a crude. And behold, I am gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me therefore a little cake first, and bring it, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, Neither shall the crews of oil fail until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah. And she and he and her house did eat many days, and the barrel of meal wasted not. Neither did the crews of oil fail according to the word of the Lord which he spake by Elijah. There's a prophet in the Bible that when the word of God came to him was given a mission to go and to tell a certain people to repent. We are not told that this is the first time or the tenth time that the word of God has come to this prophet, only that he is speaking to him in this passage of text. The prophet, when he received this mission, most likely tells the Lord, okay, God, I'll go and do that. But then, as soon as he thinks the Lord's not looking, he turns around and he runs as hard and as fast and as quietly as he can in the opposite direction. He boards a ship to go to the furthest city that he can think of to get away from the place that God has told him to go to. This man is called Jonah and the place that he was sent to or he was asked to go to was Nineveh. Nineveh was known for being very cruel and violent in battle. 
They had no compassion on anyone when it came to battle, and they were a very feared people. Jonah boarded this ship, and after he boarded the ship, the ship was overtaken by a violent storm. Jonah knew that the storm had come upon the ship because he was not obeying God. He begged and pleaded with the men on the ship to throw him overboard, but they would not until they realized that they were going to go down. Jonah says, if you'll throw me in, you will be okay. They throw Jonah in. He's swallowed by a fish. The fish spits him out after three days, and then when he comes out of the fish, Jonah goes to Nineveh. He gets to Nineveh, and what happens? Every person in the city repents. From the king to the lowliest servant, they repent. Not after begging or pleading, Jonah preaches and they repent. And then what happens? Jonah becomes very angry. Very angry. And I know he's thinking, I cannot believe this. After all that has happened to me, I've spent three days in the belly of a fish and all this stuff. And then I come in here and I speak a few words and they all put sackcloth on and repent. I can't believe it. I thought they need to be destroyed because that's what God said was going to happen if they did not repent. So now we go to another place. There's another man. His name's Elijah. He's a lowly Tishbite. He comes in. Where does he come in in the Bible? He comes in in the first part of chapter 17. And he says that he approaches Ahab, the king of Israel. Now at this point in time, Israel and Judah are split. There's a split kingdom. There's ten tribes in Israel and there's two in Judah. And a lot of people I have read since I've been studying this has said that Elijah comes in with much boldness and gusto. And he comes in to say, wow, you know, he's all powerful. He's got, but I think maybe there was a little of that. But I also think that Elijah was going in front of a king that was not nice to prophets. It was known that he was not nice to prophets. And I think Elijah had a little bit of nerves. So when he comes in and he said, if because of all the bad things that you have caused it to happen to this country by your worship of Baal and all these things, there will be no rain on this land until the word of God says there will be like rain. Then it says that God tells Elijah to go and hide yourself. Go and hide yourself. There's a little brook named Cherith that's on the east side of Jordan. Go hide yourself. And then he what? What happens? He drinks water from the brook of Cherith, and then God feeds him night and day with bread and meat by ravens. Ravens to the children of Israel and to the children of Judah, they were unclean birds. They were not to be messed with. They were unclean. But God is bringing his prophet food by these unclean birds. Then the brook dries up. God says, you know what? Pack up, Elijah. I'm going to send you somewhere else. I have prepared a widow to sustain you. The word says in mind that he commanded a widow to sustain him. But I believe that word is more prepared. So Elijah packs up and he goes. He said, I'm sending you to Zarephath. There's a city inside him called Zarephath. Now, a little thing of history here is that um, Ahab's wife was a Phoenician princess from Sidon. She was the wicked of the wicked. She is the key reason why Ahab sinned so greatly. The Bible says before Ahab that no king had angered God so much as him because he not only did he worship Baal, he made him a temple, he put an altar in it, he set up an idol of Baal to worship, and he did not worship or give God one reckoning. Not one bit of attention, not one bit of, um, did he, did, no honor did he show God at all. So, God sent an Elijah to Zarephath, to this widow. He doesn't even know who the widow is. He just says, we're going, I'm going to send you, and this widow woman is going to take care of you because I've already set it up for you. 
So Elijah goes and he gets to Zarephath. And as he approaches the city, there's a woman outside gathering sticks. And he calls to her. And he probably recognizes that this woman is a widow, by the way, because of the clothes she's wearing. You know, back then, people would wear clothes according to their station in life. Uh, women that were not married wore a certain kind of clothes. Once they became married, they wore a different kind of clothes. When they was a widow, they wore something else so that they could be distinguished by what they were. So he probably knew that this was a widow by her clothes. So he calls to her, bring me a little water, a little water in a vessel, in a little vessel, just a little drink. And she probably looks at him and she probably knows that he's an Israelite because the clothes he's wearing turns around and immediately she just leaves to go and fetch him a drink of water. And as he turns to go, he also says, and when you come back, bring me a little morsel of bread in your hand. And then she stops in her tracks and she turns around and she says, I don't have any bread baked. Matter of fact, I only have a handful of meal in a jar and a little bit of oil in a jug. And then I'm, going, I'm gathering these two sticks because back then when they would bake, they would take their sticks, they would get their wood, they'd build a fire, and then when the fire died down and the hot ashes and the coals, then they would lay their dough that they had prepared in the hot ashes and it would bake. She said, she had such little that it was only going to take two sticks to bake her cake of bread. And then I'm going to go in and I'm going to bake this handful of, of meal. And me and my son are going to eat it and die. Can you imagine the thought process behind this woman or where her feelings were? Have any of us been so destitute that we had one handful of meal? That was all we had? Let me tell you, if you are not a saved person of Jesus Christ, you are destitute. There are people walking around out there every day who have one hand of meal. They probably don't even have that much because they do not have the spirit of Jesus Christ living inside of them. This lady was going to eat this little tiny cake, she and her son, and then they were going to sit down and wait for death. There's people out there waiting on death and they don't even realize they're dying. They don't even realize they're dying. This lady realized she was dying because she got my food's run out. And then Elijah says to her, um, okay, he says, well, do as you said you was going to do. But before you do that, he said, when you do that, he said, bring me a cake first so that I can have. And then you can go and do for yourself. But I'm going to tell you, there's something else. When Elijah approached Ahab, people said the reason they think that he was so bold and all this is because of how he addressed Ahab. Verse, chapter 17, verse 1 says, Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth. Now let's look at verse 12 of chapter 17. And let's see what this widow woman is going to say to Elijah. When he said, bring me a morsel of bread in thine hand. She said, as the Lord thy God liveth. Now from the point in time that, a that Elijah left Ahab and that he got to Zarephath, um, there was probably about a period of at least a year and a half. My feelings are, is that this widow woman... By the time he started talking to her, she might not have known that he was Elijah, but don't you think that maybe the word of how he approached King Ahab, Queen Jezebel's husband, that he approached him and said these things to him, and then the word through all the travelers got to Zarephath, and he walked in there and he said, As the Lord God of Israel lives, there will be no rain on this land. So not only was Elijah going to a city in Zidon, 
he also was going there with the possibility that the people that lived there knew that he caused that drought and that uh, he was going to be double guilty. Even the people in his own land, uh, well, he had to hide even from them. So she tells him, he says, go and make your cake, but bring it to me first, and then go and make one for yourself. And he said, fear not, fear not. Because the Lord God of Israel has said that the meal in your barrels and the oil in your crude shall not fail until the Lord sends rain upon the earth. You know, when I was doing this study and I got to this part, and when God was speaking to me, I could see him on the inside saying, Oh, lady, the Lord God is fixing to show you something today. You are fixing to meet the Lord God of Israel. He is going to show you <clears throat> that he is the one true living God. And I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that this woman, before Elijah got there, before he left the book of Brook of Cherub, that she had been crying out to God for help because her resources were running low and there was no prospect for any more. You know, God hears people that are not saved when they need saving. He hears them say, help me, save me. And then it's up to us to show them how to get saved. That's why God sent Elijah. He sent Elijah to that woman to show her how to be saved. Praise God. Amen. Amen. She goes to that barrel. She didn't miss with any more words. She turns around and she goes back to her house and she bakes that little cake of bread. She brings it back to him. You know, how much uh, bread does it take? If that bread was fake, how much bread does it take to save someone? How much bread does it take for God to show how powerful he is? Does it have to be a cake as big as this church, or can it be a little handful, just one morsel of bread? This lady goes and she bakes that bread, and it says in chapter 15, and she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days. Now there was another time when God provided bread. In Exodus, when the children of Israel were wandering around in the wilderness and they were crying out for food. They were crying out to Moses for food. We're starving, Moses. We need something to eat. And God told Moses, tell the children of Israel that in the morning they are to get up out of their tents and go outside with a basket. I will bring bread from heaven. And they are to gather just enough to get them through that one day. Don't gather more than they can eat. Just that day. Sometimes they didn't listen because they thought, well, I don't want to go out and gather it again tomorrow, so I'm just going to gather a whole lot up today and then I'll get me through today and tomorrow. But God said, no, the only extra day you're supposed to gather on is the sixth day. When they gathered up more than they were supposed to for that day, what happened? The worms, it rotted and the worms ate it and it had a horrible stink. It was, they were not supposed to do that. You know what? God comes to us every single day. We are together Him every single day. He wants us <coughs> Because he wants to feed you today, to clothe you today, to walk with you today, to show you his glory today, and then when tomorrow comes, he says, let's do today. Let's do 9 a.m. Let's do 12 p.m. Let's do 3 p.m. Let's do 12 a.m. 
If that short time that you've got to do with him, he will, he's okay with that. He doesn't say, okay, every morning at 9 a.m., we're going to sit down and we're going to have this. That's only if that's your time. If your time is at 10 o'clock at night, then that's your time. If the middle of your day opens up at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, that's your time. And he is there waiting on you because he knows it's coming. God does not want to be stored up in a jar. He wants to be gathered every day. He never runs out. He gives a fresh supply of himself every day, all day, without fail. We just have to go out with our baskets and gather him up. Or go to our barrel and scoop him out. Or go to our Bibles and read him up. He is there waiting for us. Ready to prove himself to us. You know, in Genesis, God took one handful of dirt, one handful of dust from the ground, and made a living, breathing human. We, the, the widow in Zarephath, you know, the, the proof was not in the handful of meal. The proof was not in the meal that kept being there day after day after day. That was not the proof of God. The proof was that they ate the bread. The proof was not in the manna being on the ground. The proof was they gathered it up in their basket and they took it in their house and they ate it. The proof was in the bread that they ate. The proof was the change in their heart. That was the proof. The proof is in the bread. When we eat the bread, the bread changes our heart. Nineveh repented because they heard the word. The widow in Zarephath was saved because she heard the word. People out there cannot be saved unless they hear the word. God said to, to Jonah, go. God said to Elijah, go. God said to the widow, and to the Ninevites to do. And they did. And they were saved. You know, um, God had prepared that widow's heart for Elijah to come. God sent Elijah to her because she asked him to. She might not have prayed, God, please send me someone here that can save me. She cried out. We don't know what she prayed, but I do believe 100% out of my heart that that little woman prayed to God. After she had prayed to Baal and her God so many times and nothing happened, and she finally, in desperation, cried out, I need to be saved. I need to be, I need help. My son is dying. I can't do anything for him anymore. We don't know what happened with the Nephites. Did one person inside that city cry out and pray for help to be saved from something? God sent Jonah there. The difference is, is that Elijah went immediately. Jonah went the other way. In the beginning of my uh, walk with God, I know that when he called me into service, I went the other way just like Jonah because I was scared to death scared to death down to the bottom of my feet of what that would entail. And I rode in a rough ship and I've had some bumpy roads to, but uh, now I'm doing, I'm trying my best to do like Elijah. And I'm going. I've gone to Zarephath. So when you witness to someone and you're talking to them, you don't know how they've been prepared you don't know if they've been prepared or not. But you also don't know that the enemy is out there that's standing right behind them that is uh, messing with them and they will turn around and they will leave you. But you know what? That's okay too. Because all you're supposed to do is to go. To go. It's up to them to do. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for this day. I thank you for this message that you've given me to preach. I thank you, Lord, for the listeners that are here to hear it. And Father, I just praise you today for being the God of my life. And I love you and I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.